thank you all for joining us for Secret Stories Behind the World's Most Iconic, iconic <clears throat> Paintings, Part 2. Don't mind me mispronouncing every other word. Uh, from Starry Night to the Nighthawks, there are some images that are so ubiquitous in our culture that we have stopped looking at them closely. This program delves into these iconic works and shares the secret stories behind their creation and reception. This program is led by art historian Jane O'Neill, who's the owner of Culturally Curious. Jane curates and delivers art appreciation programs to audiences throughout New England. She holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, Jane has worked at some of her state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, as well as the Curator Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. We again thank the uh, Boxborough and Greenfield Libraries. We thank the Tewksbury Cultural Council and the Friends of the Tewksbury Library. So all 160 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jane for joining us this morning. And Jane, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert. And thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about these secret stories. This is a really fun program because we, well, we get to we get to learn, you know, the facts behind these paintings. And like the program description says, these are paintings that are familiar, but um, but so familiar that we've almost stopped sort of wondering about them and looking closely at them. So today we get to dive into them and you get some really wonderful little nuggets about them too, which I think will carry you through a lot of great sort of cocktail conversations in the future. So let's get started with just a quick refresher. If you um, attended this program with us last, last summer, you probably remember this idea that the word icon uh, is an art historical term and it refers to uh, these kind of flat paintings, Gothic era paintings of uh, saints, uh, the, the Virgin Mary, the Christ child, often with this flat golden background, this kind of, kind of otherworldly background. And an icon was literally there to stand in for the divine. You would worship the icon. Uh, and then of course, Andy Warhol comes along in the 1960s and kind of turns that on its head and creates this flat golden background for who else but Marilyn Monroe and other celebrities and kind of points to the fact that we here, especially in America, tend to worship um, celebrities as though they're semi-divine. Anyways, so we have this idea now that some images are iconic. They, uh, they sort of have this semi-divinity to them. So, um, so today we're going to get to know them. We're going to get to know the reason they're I iconic too. So our quick program overview, if you were with us for part one, we've already seen famous faces and figures and intriguing couples. Today, we're going to cover gods and heroes and imagined spaces. And this beautiful lady here is going to take us right in. We're gonna get started with Botticelli and the birth of Venus. Now, uh, we all know this picture. We all know this absolutely gorgeous lady. She is a, a very much a symbol for beauty because she is the goddess of love. So um, there's so many interesting elements uh, about this, pa this painting. We could talk about it for hours just on its own, but just so that we're all on the same page, this was painted by Botticelli in, um, in the 1480s. If you'd like to see it in person, you have to go to Florence, Italy. It's at the Uffizi Gallery. And, um, and in this case, this is a tempera painting on canvas. It's very large in terms of scale. It's about nine feet long by almost six feet tall. And it was revolutionary for the time that it was painted because no Nobody was painting pictures of life-size nudes at this point in the early Italian Renaissance. If they were, they were, um, they were typically depictions of like Adam and Eve or something like that. And in fact, when Adam and Eve were painted, it wasn't an opportunity to really celebrate um, sexuality or sensuality even. Um, here's a slightly earlier fresco painting by the Italian, early Italian Renaissance artist Masaccio. And this is Adam and Eve getting expelled from the Garden of Eden. And you can see that the pose is a little bit similar to what we see over here with our Venus figure. 
But, um, but of course, this is a biblical story and this is a mythological story. So, so why all of a sudden this interest in mythology, this interest in, um, in sensuality and in, in nudity, where does this come from? Well, it comes from a couple of different sources, but in this case, it's all kind of brought together probably because this is an image that was created to celebrate somebody's wedding. Now, when it comes to, in particular, the, the figure of Venus here, I wanted to zero in on her first, and then we'll provide a little bit more context. Now, according to the myth, of course, uh, Venus was born of sea, for, sea foam, fully formed. So we see her being sort of blown to the shore on this giant clamshell here. And she's at the center of the painting, her hair, her body, her gaze, all of these things are elements of, of this painting that I think we've always kind of fixated on. So we're going to zero in on her and get a, a better understanding in terms of what makes this, this picture so sensual and why it's really stood the test of time in so many ways. Now I want to draw your attention First of all, to all of this hair. For Botticelli, the hair was really, a, for women, a stand-in for their, for their sensuality. It was a way to show just how beautiful they were. So the more hair and the more styled, the better. So you can see that her hair is sort of bound together at the nape of her neck, but there's so much of it. It's loose, it's curling, and it's flowing in in the breeze here. You can see that it probably would go down past her knees, but she sort of gathered it up in her hands here. Um, modestly covering herself. And this pose here, this kind of modest pose that we also saw with, um, with, with Eve in our expulsion scene just now, is a pose that comes to us from classical antiquity. This is a classical sculpture that's known as the Capitoline Venus. And, and with a sculpture like this, it allowed the implied male viewer really to see a, a nude figure, uh, a, a nude figure that almost seemed to be aware of their nudity, who's modestly covering themselves, but because it's a sculpture, you can move all around it and take in really any angle um, that, that you prefer as you're looking at this classical sculpture. So this, this kind of modest type became um, became really preferable, especially as, as we move up through the ages. It's not um, overtly sexual in that we're still looking at a nude body, but but she is she, she has some sort of sense of decorum here. But of course, you can always see past the hand. You can see through the fingers. You can still get a glimpse in terms of what you're looking at. As one art historian said, uh, when we look at Botticelli's Birth of Venus, she makes a voyeur out of all of us. So we have this idea. It's mythology, it's it's looking back at classical antiquity. For Botticelli too, he's even looking back at the Gothic past as well. We're looking at a sculpture now of the Virgin Mary with the Christ child, and it was carved out of an ivory tusk. So it already had this really nice kind of curve to it that the um, that in this case, the, the sculptor really maximizes. And he gives the, the Virgin Mary this kind of swishy pose where her hips are sort of sticking out to support the, the weight of the Christ child there. And we see something sort of similar Similar in, in the way that Botticelli has painted this figure of, of uh, the Venus here. There's this kind of swish, this swoop to her form here. In fact, I find her body just so fascinating in so many ways. Let's, let's kind of take apart uh, uh, what this pose that she has. First, we'll start with this head. It's a lovely face gazing off into the distance, but it's sort of hinged on this neck in a strange way, right? Um, it, it doesn't look... Um, perfectly natural. We also notice that she has a very, very long neck, a giraffe-like neck here, and these sort of collapsed shoulders. Now below that, she's got uh, fairly long arms, and I would say over here, an especially sort of bulky forearm. She's got a, a sort of muscular torso here, and then, um, and then this contrapposto stance where you have a shift of the hips and one leg is really doing all the work, the other leg is at rest here. But, um, but, but she's sort of leaning to the side, isn't she? If you were to sort of cover up the top of, of Venus's body here, um, it almost looks like she could be falling over in some ways. There's, there's a lot about this, this stance, this position that doesn't quite 
makes sense. Now, if we zoom back out again, let's get a sense of her companions here. She's surrounded by these sort of mysterious figures, and I think not everybody knows who they are. This figure here with the wings and the wind coming out of his, his mouth, you can just see a little bit of air blowing. He is a Zephyr figure. He is like a god of wind. And you notice that he's blowing around all of these roses in addition to actually transporting the, the Venus in, uh, in her clamshell towards the shoreline here. And you probably noticed that there's a female figure who is his companion. She's wrapped her arms and legs around him. She also has her own wings and she is considered sort of a secondary wind figure named Aura. I should mention that art historians are still constantly debating um, the, the attribution of, of each one of these secondary characters. Then we get to this woman here. She's fully clothed in this beautiful floral gown. And you'll notice that there's still flowers all around her, around her waist. There's like a garland around her neck. Notice too, this incredible hairdo that she has um, with the braids and the curls. I always think of Botticelli as having a hairstylist on call. And she's rushing over here to cover up um, Venus, to, to hide um, her naked flesh in this moment with this, this floral um, mantle here. So some art historians think of her as the personification of spring, others debate that it's summer. Um, that's sort of splitting hairs for our purposes tonight, uh, or today, I should say. And um, and then we see this sort of stylized uh, uh, setting here, where the waves are rendered in, in these short, quick white brush strokes and even the trees all kind of look stylized in the same. These, this is an orange group uh, behind them here and the oranges probably are a reference to the very powerful Medici family that existed in Florence at that time. The Medici name uh, refers to medicine and, and oranges were their symbol for their medicinal properties. Now there's a couple of elements from this picture that come straight out of Botticelli's religious painting. So for example, if we compare this to an altarpiece with the Virgin Mary uh, accompanied by various saints and angels here. You'll notice that the Virgin Mary has this gorgeous face hinged on a neck in a, in a certain way, but she's also accentuated by this clamshell, this sort of architectural clamshell in this niche over here. Botticelli essentially just takes this beautiful virgin, turns the clamshell upside down, and turns that beautiful woman into a mythological figure. I think he also updates the notion of this, this flying uh, uh, god of the wind over here by taking a religious figure, and in this case, the angel Gabriel, who's announcing to the Virgin Mary in a fresco that she is divinely pregnant. So we have this angel angel beautifully hovering over the ground. He's just come through this portal here and, um, and he's got these gorgeous wings and the voice of God, this message from God is, is coming through, through the door and then through the angel Gabriel in these straight lines emanating from him, uh, delivering to Mary the message that she will have the Christ child. Now, I, I think those straight lines correspond so perfectly to this, this little line of, of, of breath or wind coming out of the, the Zephyr over here. So there's a lot, um, a lot of visual elements that come right out of religious painting when it comes to uh, Botticelli's birth of Venus. Now, there's a lot of other choices here that um, that art historians still love to debate. We we um, we don't know much about his decision making, but we know that there's a beauty and an allure to this painting that seems timeless. She still is a standard of beauty for so many of us today. Now, I think one thing that's really interesting is that Botticelli serves as this transitional figure in the history of art. He was working in a style of painting that we refer to as a linear style, um, which literally means that there's lines in his paintings, you'll notice that he uses a hard black line to outline, let's say, the, the, the edges of her face, the edges of her nose here. It's how any of us would probably draw a figure if we were handed a pencil. And so you couldn't really get from the Gothic era up to the Renaissance, up to somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, who eliminates those lines from paintings like the Mona Lisa. You don't have those hard edges defining the contours of things. Um, but we we really needed Botticelli as this figure that sort of gets us to that point. And in this case, Botticelli is going to get us over to Leonardo da Vinci too. The, the god that we're going to consider when it comes to, to da Vinci is, of course, Jesus. And we're going to take a look at, um, at Leonardo da Vinci's 
famous painting, The Last Supper, which was painted in the final decade of the 1400s, so really not long after the birth of Venus. Now, this was a really interesting commission for Leonardo da Vinci, and if you've been to some of my other programs, if you've learned a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci, he was a famous unfinisher of his paintings. He would always sort of get distracted and, and want to do something uh, experimental or um, try something new with his paintings. So in this case, he's created this wall size painting. It is, I believe, um, 20, 29 feet wide and 15 feet high. So square footage wise, it's about the size of a, of a studio apartment. And, um, and with this painting, as he's making this fresco, which is supposed to be pigment painted into wet plaster that then dries on the wall and becomes a permanent part of the wall, he begins to think, I'm gonna add other things to this fresco. I wanna make these colors more brilliant. I want to really make them pop. And unfortunately, that meant that this painting uh, wasn't quite, it, it, it couldn't be preserved in the same way. And it actually started deteriorating sort of quickly. So I apologize for the quality of the image here. Now, let's sort of dive into what this picture is about just for a moment too. I, I, um, I feel like the world is so familiar with it because of Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. But let's just get our quick reminder here. We are looking at a space that Da Vinci has created to um, to sort of house this dramatic moment in the life of Christ where he's gathered his disciples, his apostles here. And it's the last supper. And, and it's the moment where he says to them, one of you is about to betray me. And so Da Vinci is showing us this ripple of emotion and reaction to this news, sort of running through um, the faces and the gestures of all of, uh, of all of his followers here. And of course, there are there's sort of like denials, there's pleadings, there's accusations here. And Christ is the calm center of it all. And that's accentuated by this space that Da Vinci has created with these, um, with this sort of clear perspectival lines that would then kind of recede and um, um, converge right here above Christ's head. So even the architecture of the space accentuates his importance. Now, Da Vinci, as this humanist, as this kind of revolutionary artist leading us into the high Renaissance, one of the things that he resisted doing with this painting was adding halos. So this any sort of sense of the divine here just comes from how beautifully it's painted, uh, although you could probably make the case that there's the suggestion of a halo over Christ's head because there is this little um, curved sort of half moon shape above the door here, but it's a little bit of a stretch. Now, Da Vinci had been looking looking at what his contemporaries did in terms of painting depictions of the Last Supper. So these are two um, slightly earlier renderings of the Last Supper by other Italian artists that da Vinci would have been familiar with. And right off the bat, you can sort of see uh, one of the features of these pictures is that other artists always made it very clear who Judas was. They put Judas on the other side of the table. And it's just hysterical to me uh, to, to think of, of seating all of these people and only having one of them on the other side of the table, but it made for clear storytelling, didn't it? Now, there was a whole code in terms of how you would read and understand each one of, of these disciples in terms of, of how they would react, um, because we know from, from the text, really, that, that there's a different reaction among each, each of them. So usually the poses are, are um, help us identify who each of these, these apostles are. You'll notice that in both of these paintings, you have St. John who's sort of leaning on the table. He almost looks like he's kind of snoozing up here. And that is because according to the text, um, St. John was sort of resting in Jesus's bosom at some point during the dinner. So we know that Da Vinci actually experimented with this same idea. We have a sketch here that shows Jesus at the Last Supper. We have St. John, who's basically passed out on the table, and he actually put Judas right across the table from Jesus here. So his original conception was right in line with what other artists were doing. And then he makes these revolutionary changes. He puts everybody behind the table, and he makes this kind of play out like theater. We're watching it all in a uh, uh, positioned in such a way that it's very clear to us. Although I think these days people uh, tend to still wonder which one of them is Judas. And uh, spoiler alert, it is this figure here. Um, 
I'll show you a, another rendition of this painting where you can uh, more clearly make out the, the bag of money in his hand, the silver pieces in his hand here. Now, one of the details that I always love is that this is a picture that was created inside the dining hall of a monastery. So you can imagine all of these monks taking in their, their three meals a day, sitting and eating in silence, but they have this spellbinding narrative, all of this drama playing out right in front of them. And this is drama, this is high drama. This is like the equivalent of like the real housewives of Beverly Hills, like flipping tables and that sort of thing. So this was as, like as close to good TV as you could give those monks. Um, and so I always think, you know, what a gift from Da Vinci. But like I mentioned, it began to deteriorate very quickly because of Da Vinci and because of those experiments. So within a couple of decades, it was degrading. Um, there was also a kitchen right close by for those monks. And so the smoke and the steam from the kitchen was also impacting the painting. Um, but by the 1600s, you have this door that was cut into the wall here. And that removed Jesus's feet from the painting. About 100 years later, you have Napoleon's troops who are using this very building as a stable for their horses and um, they sort of made a game of throwing manure and bricks at this painting because it was so it was in such bad shape uh, by that point and then in the 1800s it got even worse there was a huge flood where for 15 days the entire building was underwater and the walls absorbed all of this moisture the painting itself turned green and had moss growing on it so by the time you get to the end of the 19th century the early 20th century Henry James said it was um it was like the lost supper essentially it was like the saddest painting because it was uh, essentially gone but over the years we've had the opportunity to restore this work and oh before I move on to the restoration I should mention the biggest threat of all to this painting was the fact that during the building itself was actually bombed. This is the, the exact same building that we're looking at over here. You can see these kind of ornamental flourishes on the wall correspond to what we see over here. So in addition to, you know, the flooding, the the, the graffiti, um, the, 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 the holes being cut in the wall, um, the, the fact that this painting still exists is nothing short of miraculous. The, the people who were caretakers of the building actually buttressed up this wall using mattresses and pillows and even though the, the entire ceiling was collapsed, the painting itself still stood, but it was in awful condition. It looked like this by the middle of the 20th century. And so people were really just sort of despondent over the fact that Da Vinci's uh, painting was no more. But lucky for us, there were contemporary copies of da Vinci's painting. Uh, this one is at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. It was created about 25 years after da Vinci's original, and it gives us a lot of clues as to what da Vinci's painting looked like originally. So I mean, first of all, we get to see Jesus's feet, which is great. You can very clearly see the bag of money in um, in Judas's hands over here. And so we, we get a sense of how vivid uh, da Vinci's colors were to begin with. So in the end, we have this incredible work of art that um, has been sort of well, sort of buttressed up for us today with these restorations. Uh, I think you could debate how much of, of uh, Da Vinci's actual hand is still visible at this point, but we're so lucky because its composition and its storytelling is really second to none. So now we're going to move from this Italian Renaissance master's depiction of Jesus to another Italian Renaissance master's depiction of God himself and the very first man. So we are looking at, of course, Michelangelo Angelo's uh famous uh, segment from the Sistine Chapel ceiling, the creation of man. This is without a doubt the most uh, the most well-known panel from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. This was created between 1508 and 1512, and it's just over nine feet tall and about twice as long. So this is a major work. It is one of the most replicated images, religious images of all time. So in this work, we see God swooping down from the heavens, uh, and we see Adam sort of languishing here in this little patch of green earth. He has been fully formed. He is, he's physically perfect. He's perfectly muscled, uh, but he seems to have no energy, no vitality. God has yet to imbue that special something in him that will make him fully 
human? Is it a soul? Is it knowledge? Is it, um, it, is it the, some sort of other special sauce that, that all sort of comes together at this last point of connection? And, and Michelangelo sort of leaves us on the edge of our seats here because there's just a little bit of space between these fingers. God's coming in with all of this energy and vigor. Adam can barely raise his hand to meet that finger here. But we know that in just a moment, Adam will be fully human. So, um, so with this work, which I, I should mention, uh, uh, artists and, um, and and the media sort of love to replicate. We have the the, the Muppets rendition of this in terms of a parody, <laughs> excuse me. And then we have um, a photographer named Betty, Freddie Fabrice, who did a whole series of auto mechanics updating uh, Renaissance and Baroque paintings. I love this one. This is from 2015. They even got the little green drapery here flying out from underneath the, the, the figure of God. So with this work, um, I think you could make the argument that that uh, Michelangelo was thinking of, of um, sort of grander storytelling even because here he has surrounded the figure of God which is rarely depicted in the history of art I should mention and he makes his God look like uh, a, a Zeus type figure a, a, a pagan uh, a, a God in this case with this long curly beard and this hyper muscled body and he's coming swooping in he's flying through the air we can see so much of that body the fact that God is wearing a short tunic here and he's barefoot I think would have probably shocked a lot of people at the time. And he's surrounded by all of these little putti, these little Cupid type um, figures here. Notice now that one of those figures, God is resting his other hand on. And some art historians have argued that this could be a depiction of the Christ child. He, has, he is sort of singled out by God in this moment. And so with one hand, God could be creating original sin with Adam. And uh, with the other hand, he is creating redemption through the sacrifice of, of his son. Some people think that this might be Eve over here sort of waiting in the wings to be created. Some people read her as the Virgin Mary um, accompanying the, the Christ child. Now, one of the readings that I just love when it comes to the creation of Adam, it comes to us from the world of neuroscience, where scientists uh, are able to overlay the shape of the human brain on top of this uh, figure grouping that, uh, that includes God and all of those surrounding putti figures here. And it would make sense. I mean, Michelangelo as a humanist, as, as a Renaissance artist, most definitely dissected human bodies and was familiar with the anatomy of the brain. And so when we're thinking about what is God there to give Adam, he is there to give him free will, um, to give him wisdom. And what better way to do that than with a, a physical and a human personification of the human brain. It's it's um, sort of a knockout reading of what is already a knockout painting. Now for Michelangelo, as he's thinking about creating this painting, he spent a lot of time sketching the torso of Adam. We know that Michelangelo just loved the male nude body and he loved nothing more than muscles. So we can see all of the attention that he's paying to the muscles, particularly of Adam's torso. But I think what's also really fascinating is that Michelangelo spent a lot of time um, sketching those hands too, those gestures of those two hands meeting. And it's almost as though he understood in some way just how important that was going to be to storytelling. And, um, and think of the impact that it has had through the ages. You can just see those two hands coming together now and, and understand the whole story too. So, um, so here is Michelangelo sort of figuring that all out in his sketches. And of course it becomes a, an iconic painting when he, when he puts his, his, his paint to, to, um, to the plaster there. <coughs> Excuse me, the next work we're going to be looking at, we're sort of switching away from gods and we're going to uh, consider heroes for a moment. Uh, we are moving ahead in history. We're now in the Dutch Baroque period. We're looking at what is undoubtedly Rembrandt's masterwork. This is a painting called The Night Watch from 1642, and it's at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. It's also a massive painting. It measures about 12 feet high by 14 feet wide. <clears throat> It, and um, and it was really revolutionary for the time when uh, Rembrandt painted this work. What we're looking at is 
essentially a group portrait of, of a militia group. <laughs> and this, these kinds of paintings were a dime a dozen in Amsterdam at the time. There were all sorts of these little militia groups and they would all have group portraits together that would look sort of like this. Everybody would pay their fair share and artists would make sure to include each and every person's face as clearly as possible for better or for worse, no matter how they look. But my, uh, uh, Rembrandt, I'm sorry, decided he wanted to do something different. He didn't want it to be like school picture day. He wanted to tell a grand story story of what this militia was capable of doing. So he shows them in this moment where there's a call to arms and everybody's assembling. There's all this energy and excitement and it's uncertainty really as they're coming together. And there's uncertainty for us, especially now because Rembrandt was not really concerned with historical accuracy when he was painting a picture like this. He was literally just throwing random props from his studio at these people. And so he'd say, carry this rifle, carry this sword, put on this helmet, and none of it is from the same time period. So of course, when art historians look at it today, they, they see it as like this mishmash of, 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 uh, of um, attributes here. It, it, it's, it's confused people for quite some time. And there are so, there are also um, a number of confusing elements and figures in, in, the, in this particular work of art. My eye always goes to this little golden girl here, sort of in the middle ground. She provides a nice sort of bright counterpoint to one of the leaders of the militia over here who's dressed in this gorgeous yellow costume. But as we zoom into this little girl, you'll notice that she's got a dead chicken hanging upside down from the rope on her waist. And for years, art historians were wondering about who is this girl? What's with the chicken? Um, the, the, the way we sort of understand her today and how she fits into this picture of a militia is that she's sort of like the embodiment of the mascot of this group. And you can think of, um, Think of her almost like a raven claw type cat, uh, mascot. It's the talons there that are, are most important. Now, one really fun thing about Rembrandt's Night Watch that I don't think a lot of people know is that Rembrandt himself is in this painting. At least that's that's a, a, a dominant theory that I definitely subscribe to. But he's only included a tiny little sliver of himself and you'll get a real kick out of this once you see it. So right back here, almost at the center of the picture, we've got these two figures looking off in different directions. And then there's just this little head that's popping up in between them. And all you can see is an eyeball. There's that eyeball. And I think it corresponds really, really um, solidly to self-portraits that Rembrandt created from around the time. This is one of the uh, works that was stolen from the Gardner Museum, incidentally, this little etching down here. So he just had to kind of sneak himself into this great big work that he was so proud of. And in fact, this great big work is actually smaller than it was when Rembrandt originally painted it. It was created for the interior of essentially where the, uh, the, the meeting place for this militia. And then of course, over the years, it was transported from that meeting place to the Rijksmuseum, but it was too big to fit out the door. And at that point, they didn't realize, alter the door, don't alter your Rembrandt. So they cut the Rembrandt down. You can see that there are, there are several figures that were cut out of the painting in order to move it to the museum. And you might be thinking, well, how do they know? <laughs> well, there were copies made of this. So we do have a sense in terms of what was lost. These days, people flock to the Rijksmuseum to see this picture. It's like the Netherlands answer to the Mona Lisa. There's always a crowd in front of it. And um, and the Rijksmuseum realizing that it is so significant to their history has gone above and beyond to protect this painting, which has been attacked by various people over the years. It's been slashed with knives. People have thrown acid at it. And, um, and so in order to make sure that nothing ever happens to it again, especially something uh, catastrophic like a fire, the Rijksmuseum actually installed a trap door right underneath the painting. So if something were to happen in this gallery space, the painting can be just dropped off of the wall and go into the chute to then protect it from people or from climate change or whatever, whatever have you. So this is a painting that's filled with tons of juicy, juicy tidbits like this, but we still have one more hero to touch on before we shift gears. So just from these parodies alone, you know what we're going to be looking at. We've got uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus over here for, with the cast of Veep. We've got Stephen Colbert posing as him over here with uh, his correspondence and writers from the Colbert Report, I think. Um, and then 
we have the original painting. Of course, Washington crossing the Delaware, painted by the artist Emanuel Loitza in 1851. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I think one really good thing to know is that, um, is that this painting was painted so long after, 75 years after the American Revolution. Oftentimes we take this image as sort of gospel, almost as though it was like a document of what exactly happened. And it's very much an artist's uh, imaginative construction of what that could have looked like. Um, also, the artist, as I mentioned, is, is German. And so there's there's some details here that really kind of point more towards uh, German culture and geography uh, more so than American culture and geography. But this was, of course, uh, an image that still inspires us today. And it's probably still on the cover of all the American history textbooks. Now, I mentioned this is in the collection of the Met. It's a crowd favorite, as you can see here. People love to recreate the picture standing in front of it. But the the... Uh, the curators at the Met don't particularly like it. There's a lot of problems with this painting that I'll share with you, but it's also huge as you can see. And so it's almost always out on view because people like it, but also because there's there's not a lot of good places to store it at the Met. So people get to take it in um, for better or for worse. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening here and what um, Loitza got right and maybe what's what Loitza got wrong here. So this is, of course, the attack on the Hessians uh, in New Jersey on Christmas night. And we have George Washington being emphasized by this, by this, uh, the light of the dawn, basically, uh, while while the sun is, is still sort of low in the sky. We've got all of these great red highlights throughout the picture that sort of move our eye along. And this boat is represented as kind of a cross section of America at the time. I think actually one thing that is really inspiring about this picture is that we do get a, a, a nice sense of, of the diversity of, of America here. We've got like a frontiersman here. Here's a man wearing like a Scottish bonnet. There's an African-American figure back here who's rowing. Another frontiersman, possibly a Native American at the back of the boat, uh, two peasant type farmers over here, one of them with a wounded head. And then this figure more recently uh, in, in, um, in the red shirt has been interpreted as a, uh, as a woman dressed up as a man to participate in the revolution. And then we have um, various generals and, and other supporting cast here. This is um, uh, uh, Monroe who would go on to be a future president. And then of course we have George Washington Washington standing triumphantly towards the front of the boat here. But let's talk a little bit about uh, what's unusual. What's what's kind of, what, what Loitza got wrong with this picture? Well, first of all, the flag that's depicted in this picture did not exist at, or at least this version of the flag did not exist at the time of Washington crossing the Delaware. We also know that Washington crossed in the middle of the night during a snowstorm. So you wouldn't get, you know, this kind of brilliant light that's silhouetting his profile here, making him look so incredibly heroic in this moment. I mean, instead, you know, we saw some sort of leader who's sort of cowering and huddled in the, in the cold. You don't quite get the same impact. Now, in addition to that light, you'll see that there's kind of phantom light around this picture too. We've got our sun over here, but there's... Um, there's beams of light uh, that, that are visible way over here on, on the right of the picture. So, so a little bit inconsistent in terms of where the light is coming from and, and how it's hitting things. Now, the river here is modeled off of the River Rhine, not the, the, not the rivers of New Jersey. And so we can see that ice is formulated the way it formulates in, in Germany. Uh, ice doesn't look like this in, in America. And so if you've always wondered about that, now you know it's just not American ice. We also have, know that this is the wrong boat model and, um, and it, it's sitting very, very low in the water. Um, if you are really into reconstructing history, they actually recreate George Washington's crossing of the Delaware every single year. Uh, um, you can go and see it and you can see that the boat looks very different and it rides much higher up. And, and Washington probably could have stood up in it, but when it was riding so low like that, I don't know, that, that's, that's sort of a, a dangerous choice. So 
other fun facts here is that this painting was, act, it actually has multiple copies. Um, one of them was destroyed during World War II, but another one, which is much smaller, was actually on display at the White House for some time and recently sold back in 2015, I believe, for about $43 million. So that's a nice chunk of change for a, a piece of American history. So what we're going to do now is shift gears away from gods and heroes. And now we're going to look at a few imagined spaces. And these are probably some of the best known spaces you've ever seen in the history of art. We'll move through them chronologically too. We're going to start off with Hieronymus Bosch's famous altarpiece called the Garden of Earthly Delights. This dates to right around 1500. And now when I say altarpiece, I'm referring to a, 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 a hinge painting that sort of has panels on it that open and close like, like the shutters of a window. So we're looking at it with the shutters closed. We see the orb of the earth represented as almost like a snow globe here, um, that the land doesn't cover the entire orb here. We're, we're looking at the world with like a little glass bubble over it. This is God represented over here. Um, uh, and, and there's text that that suggests that, that this is uh, at a specific point in, the, in God's creation process. Now, when we open the Garden of Earthly Delights, we can see this imagined space that Bosch has created and how overwhelming it is. I love this image with the person in front of it because you get a, a sense of scale here. When this altarpiece is completely wide open, it is uh, about 12 feet long, and I believe it's about six feet high. Now, whenever you're looking at an altarpiece like this, they're typically read from left to right, but the central panel, the biggest panel, is always the main show here. So we'll sort of move through this the same way. Check out the left and then move to the right to better understand this. Now, the Garden of Earthly Delights probably wasn't the name of the picture originally. Art historians still struggle to understand what is actually happening here. But what we do know is that this is an image about, um, about sensuality, about sin, and about um, uh, about punishment uh, along the way. And so something like this probably was not created for a church setting, even though it's in a religious format. This probably would have been for someone's private viewing. So let's start over here with the creation. Oh, here we get to see that, that this is an overwhelming image. Uh, we can see that there are dozens and dozens of figures here. And we have real and imagined animals throughout. And Bosch is probably best known as an artist who um, really went wild and, and got very creative with his depictions of hell. But like I said, we're going to start over here with the creation. Um, and so we have God the Father with Adam and Eve, always easy to determine when you see nudes in a religious picture. Um, uh, that, that they are, in fact, Adam and Eve. And this would have been the Garden of Eden. We see all of these animals kind of coexisting peacefully. I see an elephant and a giraffe, but wait, there's a unicorn. And as we zoom in here, we'll see a lot of strange imagined creatures in this Garden of Eden. Um, I, one thing that I find sort of funny whenever I look at, at these figures here, at least, is that this painting was created almost at the, the exact same time as Michelangelo's creation of Adam. And you can see that there's a real difference in terms of the attention to human anatomy. Bosch is interested in creating this fantasy world here. So what I wanted to share with you from this panel that has the Garden of Eden in it is just some of these wild creatures that he came up with for his Eden. In this case, we see all of these um, amphibious creatures coming out of the water. Um, some of them have multiple heads, some of them have multiple legs, and they are coming up on in, into land and into little caves here. They all look um, like some pretty gross little creepy crawlies here, don't they? They sort of um, make me feel a little unsettled. Now here's a fun fact, that, that, um, that close-up corresponds to this section of the painting here. And if we frame it up this way, you can see what almost looks like a face. This little rock formation here seems to be like a nose. And all of these little creepy crawlies, including this one over here with the shell, seem to suggest a human profile. This could be like an eye. This could be like a, an, a long eyelash. Maybe this is even like a mustache. And what we'll see in just a few moments is that Salvador Dali, the uh, 20th century surrealist artist, was 
really inspired by this little section of Bosch's painting and adopted this motif as his own signature for many of his works. So this is a, a sideways Salvador Dali over here. Now, once we move on from the creation, we have the Garden of Earthly Delights. And this is where all of the sin is really taking place. This is a picture that's all about hoarding, about sensuality, and that's emphasized by, uh, by large pieces of fruit throughout the picture and these very large uh, birds. Uh, especially in the foreground here. So the birds do it, the fruit does it in terms of pollination. And so we have all sorts of, of, of um, groupings of amorous couples. We can see this group here, and there is at least one other in the painting too, that is enclosed in what looks like a little glass bubble. It almost reminds me of the orb of the earth that we started with. So there's some art historians that believe that this little orb here is a reference to a proverb that you know roughly translates to happiness is as fragile as a bubble or is as temporary as a bubble or as fragile as glass. And so we get um, this notion of, of a proverb being being uh, visualized with, with this particular painting. But you can see how naughty Bosch gets with this very creative picture here. Uh, uh, all sorts of references, like I said, to um, to to amorous groupings here and and people uh, committing sin essentially throughout the painting. But the more time you spend with it, the more unusual and uh, and outrageous it really gets. So these are figures in the foreground, in the middle ground. There are these uh, nude women in a pool of water, and all of these men parading around on creatures, both real and imagined, sort of trying to impress them in this kind of parade. And then in the far distance, there are these mountains and sort of phallic looking fountains, more nude figures doing inexplicable things like getting out of the water into a big egg over here. So his, um, his imagination almost had no limits, but really he unleashes it to its full potential by the time we get to hell. Now, once again, we could spend hours on this, but when we're looking at it sort of from a distance like this, you can see more sort of phallic elements here with like this, this knife blade coming, uh, emerging from these two ears, um, disembodied ears up at the top of the image. We can see a human torso that sort of functions like an eggshell and we can see inside of it, the arms have been transformed into these tree trunks going into a boat. Everything is, um, is illogical. It's nonsensical. It is like your worst nightmare. So I wanted to share with you uh, a couple of incredible details in the foreground here. This is believed to be his depiction of the devil. He's blue, he's bird headed, he's got vessels on his feet and a cauldron on his head, and he is literally consuming, consuming human beings and then excreting them. That seems like a horrible way to go. Also, you know, flaming birds coming out of your rear end also seems horrible. But for Bosch, one of the ways he imagined um, the torture in hell uh, taking place was was to be to uh, uh, to integrate musical instruments as as instruments of torture. So in this case, we can see a figure that's contained inside a drum. If you thought your kid playing drums in the basement sounded bad. Imagine being inside of that drum. Over here, we can see a figure that's been impaled on a harp. Imagine those strings going through your body, and then what it would feel like if they were plucked to have those vibrations go through your body. How do you even come up with something? something like this. And then just recently, art historians have turned their attention to this music that has been written uh, in this text and across the rear end of this nude figure here. And it's been transcribed into and um, and and now somebody has, has has played it. You can go on YouTube and listen to the music of Hell that Bosch um, created before this this particular painting. So you close this painting all up again, and another interpretation of this same scene is that this is essentially the world after the flood, and and and. God has essentially washed away all of the sins once you close this picture up. But certainly it is a fantastic, um, highly creative take on, on, um, on humans' existence in this world. Now, when it comes to imagined spaces, the one that the world probably knows best is Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night from 1889. This is at the Museum of, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York City. Now, 
a kindergartner could recognize this painting for you. And I think most people feel like, yeah, I know Starry Night. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening in this picture and why it was created. I wanted to start with, with um, part of the reason this image is so famous is because it's so closely associated with Vincent van Gogh and his mental illness. This image was painted while he was living in an asylum. This was just a few months after he had severed his own ear. And so here we're looking at the artist with uh, with a bandage over that same ear. Um, here is his room at the asylum. You can go and, and, and visit it and you can look out that window that had bars on it and imagine what his life was like while he was living there. It was actually not a bad place for him to be. Uh, here's a picture that he created of the hallway of that same asylum. You can see that the doors were wide open and Vincent van Gogh had the freedom to go in and out and you know walk around the garden. and. Um, and so we don't, it's not exactly this idea of, of a tortured artist who's, who's um, gazing out of his bedroom window, capturing the, this pulsating night sky. Instead, this is an artist who is, who actually um, uh, had the opportunity to really think about what this composition could be. Now, he was tortured. <laughs> it, when he first got to this asylum, that is when he started working on the irises that we see here that I know are a favorite for so many. Um, these were painted the same year, have a lot of those same beautiful colors in it. And he said, you know, he couldn't stop working on this painting. This is an artist who could crank out a masterpiece in a day. He worked on this one for about two weeks and he said it was a lightning rod for his mental illness. He felt like if he could just keep working on it, then he would be okay. So at the asylum, he was given his own studio space. This is a painting that he created of that studio. It's um, on the first floor of the building. And that was where he created the Starry Night. He might have had the vision up in his room. Um, incidentally, the vision doesn't even uh, directly correspond to, to the view um, of that particular region. So it, it, it's not as though he had a vision at night and captured it. This was a really sort of thoughtful approach to, to um, image making. He went down uh, down to his studio, he worked on it during the day, and he took artistic license with, with the landscape that he created. So he adds in this huge flame-like cypress tree as a tall framing device on one, th one third of the picture. He adds in this little church that we see over here, but he makes that spire as sharp and as pointy and as tall as possible. He leaves out the domed roof in the back, but he walks us into this landscape through the, the, the tops of these little um, houses and um, and then adds in these rolling hills that don't really exist there, but they they are a really nice echo of this kind of roiling sky that we see up above there. So we have these this incredible constellation of these uh, pulsating stars and and the moon and planets with with these auras around them. Some people wondered if this was you know the way uh, Vincent Van Gogh saw the world, but this was really the way he applied brush strokes to canvas. This is really consistent with other ways that he painted. Now this this particular motif right here at the center of of the of the image, it almost looks like a wave coming in, and and some people even interpret this as like a spiral spiral galaxy. Uh, images of spiral galaxies already existed. They were published by the 1850s. Vincent van Gogh could have very well seen an image like this to add into his night sky. And we know he would have seen Japanese wood flock prints like the one below here, the great wave. And that without a doubt inspired this composition of this roiling night sky um, out, out uh, in, in front of him. So all of this kind of comes together here in what was a very calculated painting. Now, when he first created The Starry Night, he felt like it was a failure. He actually wrote to his brother that it was like a dud of a painting. And of course, we've all grown to love it over the years. Um, it, we love it so much that the Museum of Modern Art has placed these um, incredible photographs of it on their website. You can move the painting around on your computer and get in close and see the brush strokes. In many cases, he's actually just applying paint from the paint tube itself here, but it's, it's almost a sculptural painting. That paint is so 
thick there. So this is an emotional painting. This is a painting that, that transports us to a specific place and makes us feel a specific way. You couldn't get to Edvard Munch's painting, The Scream, a few years later without Vincent van Gogh sort of establishing an imagined space like The Starry Night that really um, has this tremendous emotional impact on you as you're looking at it. So the last imagined space we're going to look at today is also an emotional emotional landscape, but I wouldn't say that it's, dream well, it is dreamy. I wouldn't say that um, that it's a, a, a positive emotional response. We are, of course, looking at, um, at Salvador Dali's painting, The Persistence of Memory from 1931. This is from the, uh, the Museum of Modern Art as well. Now, this painting, I think, tends to have a little bit of a gross out factor to it, right? Um, this idea of, of something that we know is being very solid and firm, so suddenly wilting and melting these timepieces over here. And then the collection of insects, this blob-like element in the middle of the picture. What is all of this about? Well, I think the reason this painting has become an iconic painting, an instantly recognizable painting, all you have to say is melting clocks and people know what you're talking about. The reason is because Salvador Dali, as this great showman, said he was painting his dreams. And there's a clarity to this painting, particularly in the way he's rendered the mountains over here, the shoreline, and even the clocks themselves that corresponds to our sense of a dream-like state. But then there's these illogical pieces, the um, the, the, the wilting uh, uh, time pieces over here that also really align with the, with the, with the, um, with, with the way things don't quite work in the same way in, in our dreams as they do in the real world here. So Salvador Dali, who we can see in a photograph from just a couple of years after he painted this picture, promoted this idea that he was putting himself into what he called a paranoic trance in order to create these visions that he could then transpose onto a canvas like this. And I think that's what really captured the public's imagination around this. I would say that there's a lot of art historians that are very skeptical about what he said he was doing, but it was, um, it was, a, it, it was, um, it, it made for, for great press, essentially. So this is what you would call a surrealist painting. There's a, logic, a, a lot of um, illogical uh, uh, assemblage of, of um, non-related objects in a work like this. But the blob in particular here, this kind of um, anamorphic mush is said to be Salvador Dali's self-portrait. So if we turn it sideways, you turn your head, um, it corresponds to that, that little piece of land that we saw uh, when we were looking at the Garden of Earthly Delights there. Now, Salvador Dali also is kind of playing with our, our, our sense of, of, of the material world here. For him to add all of these, these insects, all of these ants congregating on the back of, of this uh, little pocket watch here, that was supposed to evoke a sense of disgust and remind us of decay, even though these, these timepieces obviously cannot rot. Uh, if we zoom in just a little bit closer, you'll notice on the timepiece just behind it, there is a single button here. There's a fly sitting on, on the face of this clock. And that is, yes, it's a pun. It's the pun of time flies. So there's a little bit of a cheekiness to this too. Now, um, when this work was first exhibited, it made such a splash. In fact, there was a, a, a critic who put, proclaimed the painting 10 by 14 inches of Dali dynamite. And it was the image that was reproduced again and again and again, uh, whenever the exhibition was first discussed. So it has become this iconic work. Now, most people don't know that Salvador Dali painted another version of the persistence of memory. This is called the disintegration of the persistence of memory. This comes to us in, in the 1950s, where he's sort of ruminating on the atomic age. We've still got our melting clocks. We still get the mountains and, and the water, um, but everything has been subdivided into almost like atomic particles. And we see what look like uh, warheads pointing off into the distance. Dali added this big fish over here for him. He said the fish was a symbol of life. And he has even uh, created uh, 
uh, that same marking that we see on the fish on the blob-like self-portrait that he includes in the foreground. But Salvador Dali actually goes back to these melting clocks again and again and again throughout his career. Here we have a sculpture. This is actually a tapestry. Here we have playing cards. Because when you say melting clock, you know exactly which painting we're talking about. And he made so much money off of this single concept. It really kept his career afloat for decades beyond this. And of course, there's always great parodies of it. We've got the Simpsons over here with each member of the family sort of melting in their own way. And in this case, it's the rotting donut that's attracting all of the bugs over here. The Simpsons, they're always great for uh, an art spoof. They have Salvador's Deli here instead of Dali, the persistence of lunchtime. So they're always good for a laugh. So just to wrap up on some of the big ideas, what do we take away from all of these little nuggets that we're getting today? Well, well, we have um, just a few. We have this notion that we love to find out the, the secret meaning behind works of art. But I think that the works that, that really withstand the test of time have meaning that is a little bit flexible, that can change with us as, as a culture, as a community, as we change along the way. And of course, we love anything beautiful, whether it's uh, Botticelli's Venus and her spiral curls hit over here or the spiral galaxies that Vincent van Gogh created. There's always something that brings us back and makes us wonder. So I will end there for now, and I welcome any questions or comments that you have about the secret stories that we looked at today. And I'll start looking at the chat here, and if I see a question, I'll, um, I'll let you know what it is and do my best to answer it. Jane, you take a sip of your uh, drink there. Uh, folks, uh, if uh, you have a question for Jane, please type it into the Q&A. If you have a comment for Jane, please type it into the chat. And Jane, there's uh, four or five questions in the Q&A and a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, Sumner said, the legs of the woman on the left are totally unrealistic. Is that a known flaw in the painting? Sumner, could you come, would you mind coming back and, um, and letting us know which work you might've been looking at for that one? Um, uh, Mary, thanks for your kind words. Colleen asked, did Van Gogh sever his ear due to tinnitus or just his mental illness? Colleen, that's a great question. And it, to some degree, it's a little bit unknowable for us. Sorry, I'm heading in the wrong direction there. Here we go back to Van Gogh and that ear. Um, I, I think most people ascribe it to his mental illness, but tinnitus could have been a contributing factor to that. Um, it's it's such an unusual thing to do in terms of self-harm that that I think most people think of it as, as a, a, a symptom of, of the mental illness or evidence of the mental illness, but that's a great question. Um, let's see. Thank you for the kind words that are coming in. I really appreciate that. Oh, okay, and Sumner says the woman's uh, legs that they've been looking at were back with the Venus. And let me just make sure I know the legs of the woman on the left are totally unrealistic. Oh, yes, okay, <laughs> Sumner, thanks for bringing this up. This is a really, this is maybe what's considered a flaw in the painting. So here's one leg of um, this kind of secondary um, Zephyr type figure that uh, has the legs kind of wrapped around the, the primary Zephyr figure here. And this is considered, I, I don't know if people call it a flaw, but the legs definitely don't make sense. They don't correspond to, to how this person's legs would work anatomically really. So, um, what a sharp eye you have, Sumner, for bringing this up. Thanks for raising that issue too. Next time any of you see the Botticelli with a group of friends, you could just say like, hey, that, that lady's legs don't make any sense and sort of blow people's minds. Um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So so you could say that's a flaw on, on Botticelli's part, uh, part for sure. But I think everybody's so busy looking at the, at the nude lady at the center that they miss it. So thanks for raising that, Sumner. Um, let's see, let me just catch up on everything else here. Um, such kind words. I really appreciate it. As for and, the question, um, uh, Jane, if you want to yeah. jump over to the Q and A box, I don't know if you sure. see that on your screen, but there yes. should be six or seven questions there. Most of what's left in the comments are are, are just uh, okay. nice things people are saying about you. 
Okay. <laughs> um, David asked, what is the significance of the Babinski sign in the birth of Venus? The Babinski sign, David, you've stumped me. Maybe you could say a little bit more about what the Babinski sign is, um, because this is new to me. Uh, let's see here. Stephen says, one to two of the apostles in the Last Supper seem to be women. Is this a statement the artist is making, or am I viewing it wrong? Well, I would never say that anyone's viewing it wrong, but I think that some of these figures... They certainly look feminine, but it's sort of in line with the way that the apostles were painted. Um, sometimes, uh, especially if they didn't have beards, these men with long hair might look pretty feminine. I'm not sure that um, that uh, da Vinci was trying to make any of them specifically look like women. Um, as far as I know, this was supposed to be like a pretty straightforward depiction of the Last Supper. But I, I mean, you're not wrong in, in sort of uh, uh, pointing out the fact that that some of them look more feminine than the others than others. Uh, Emily says the brain shaped cloud in the creation of Adam seems to be a bit far fetched Were divine figures typically enclosed in a red almond shape, indicating they are divine or not human, an easier explanation. Emily, what a great comment. Yes. So uh, oftentimes, and sorry, I don't have one of those in this particular program. But sometimes Jesus was represented in being enclosed in um, in an almond shaped halo, basically that would encapsulate his entire body. I, if if memory serves me correctly, it's a mandorla, and so um, so perhaps you could think of that as like a mandorla around God. I've never thought of it that way before, Emily. That's really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I guess my mind never went to it in that direction because to me, this is so clearly a drapery that that is sort of encapsulating all of them. But I think you could certainly make that case. Um, that That's a wonderful uh, alternative reading. And, um, and certainly the idea that it's a brain is an alternative reading. So both, both totally valid. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Joseph says Van Gogh was on Digitalis. Yes, no, he was. That was part of his treatment as far as I understand. And he did create a portrait of um, the doctor that was treating him. And there was Digitalis in, or Fox Club in, in that painting. Um, Francine says, sorry, I misheard. I thought you said Nighthawk. You said Nightwatch. <laughs> Only four centuries apart. I might have misspoken at some point, Francine. Um, do art historians know if the Last Supper is a Jewish Seder? Really good question, Joyce. And I am, um, on that, I, I, I'm not certain. I, I think they have a, a good sense in terms of what was served there. But to be honest, I'm not I'm not certain if it, cor I, I don't know enough about satyrs, to be honest, to know if it corresponds. I'll have to look into that. Good question. Sumner says, since Adam was the first human, why did he have a navel? <laughs> Great question. We get, we have, we have to pick on Michelangelo about that one, right? <laughs> I wonder if in, in, in his sketches, did he, did he have a, a navel from the get-go? Um, <laughs> uh, Michelangelo just loved the, the male form so much. He just couldn't leave it out, right? <laughs> the split toe, the Babinski sign is used as a signature for some artists. It was found in a number of sculptures. David, thanks for coming back with that. The Babinski sign, I am definitely going to have to look into this. Um, the split toe. So um, I uh, obviously I just don't know enough about this to answer, but I think you're going to send us all on a little Googling mission after this to learn a little bit more about that. Thank you for thank you for contributing it. I, I always love to learn more. So thank you. Uh, Barb says, what is the hand under Adam? Is that a foreshadowing of the apple? Let's go back and see the hand under Adam. Huh. The, oh, oh, right here. Okay, so I'm sorry I don't have a full sized shot of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, but Michelangelo included like 300 extra <laughs> figures that are just like framing devices when it comes to um, to the individual panels of, um, of, of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So this is really just a it, it's there are four figures that are, are framing the picture itself and 
it's interesting that you think of this as, as potentially foreshadowing the apple and and wow that you're kind of blowing my mind with that as I think of it now I'm not even sure if this is true but but generally I mean people just don't even think of them as having an impact or relationship to those narratives now I'm going to have to go back and, and check thanks for bringing that up that's really fascinating um Colleen says, did you say there was a money pouch represented in the Last Supper paintings, which is a reference to Judas? Most certainly. So Judas has his elbow on the table here and he is holding a little bit of money. You can see it a little bit more clearly in the contemporary copy. Um, he's also spilled the salt, which is another way that people um, oftentimes identify him here. And then somebody says, maybe Venus's torso is out of position rather than her legs. If you look at the body, they are all in alignment. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, her legs don't really seem to be in the right place to support the weight of her torso. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, it, it, it's not quite a logical composition there, did it, is it? And then Florence says, did Botticelli paint the birth of Venus with oil paint? This is actually tempera paint. Um, so, and that's, that's part of the reason why we see like every strand of hair on her head. So great question there. Um, but we do get these wonderful kind of golden elements throughout it, don't we? Ee um, e e says, I think that, uh, Okay, I think I got to that question in um, in the Q&A. So I think I've hit all of them. I've done the best I could. These are great questions. I love the details that people are noticing and I really appreciate all of your time and attention. Thank you everybody for joining us today. So folks, let's give Jane one last big virtual round of applause for a wonderful job as usual. And the good news is folks that we only have to wait three more weeks until Jane's next presentation with us. Jane will be back on Thursday, May 4th at 10.30. Uh, we're going in a different direction. She'll be giving a brand new presentation called Revolutionary Design, Modern Architecture in New England. Uh, and uh, registration is open and uh, you'll receive more information in the follow-up email I send later today along with the feedback survey and the recording of this program. Jane, any last words before we wrap it up? No, just thank you everybody so much for spending your morning with me. I appreciate it. All right, Jane, great job as always, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Have a great day. Enjoy this weather, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.